I mean, I'll tell you what, I, I speak a lot. And um, I get out speaking. One time I got, to, very early in my career, I got to speak to a group of retirees, let's call them. And it was at a place where they all lived together, a retirement home. And they fed them turkey for lunch. Now, we know what happens on Thanksgiving when we have turkey, right? That tryptophan kicks in a little bit. So I'm in the middle of one of my, I thought, a pretty rocking speech. And there I was, speaking, and all of a sudden they, they finished their turkey there, and I'm speaking, I'm just getting ready to roll, and all I saw was dentures and nostrils. <laughs> so I'm going to try not to put you to sleep today. Um, today we're going to talk about sustaining your health. And I loved all the speakers and presenters before me because they really set me up for success. So I have to thank Larry and Brielle and, and Dr. Anderson. So they really set me up for success because I'm not taking you to the gym. Although you may have a trainer, you may go to the gym. I am not going to be your medical professional. I'm completely not qualified to do that. But what I am qualified to do is work with you in the areas of your attitude. Work on the way that you think. Work on your thought processes. And how do you do that? Because your brain is the most powerful, powerful muscle in your body. I know you can debate. I know it's probably not a muscle, right, Dr. Anderson? But I'm going to call it a muscle because it is the most powerful muscle in your body. Because whatever you believe in your head will come true in your life. That's the bottom line. So first I want to start off, and Judy introduced me as the executive coach for executive managers, that's true. Um, I want to make a, def a definition, a little, give you a little definition difference here uh, between a mentor and a coach. You probably have mentors, you probably have coaches. Um, and I, my upcoming book is called Roll Up Your Sleeves and Get to Work, so I'm going to do just that. I roll up my sleeves and get to work today. Let's go. Ah, we're talking, right? And I define the difference between a coach and a mentor. A mentor is typically someone who has been where you want to go, has done what you wanted to do or want to do. And what they do, they will take you through based on their knowledge, their experience, on how to get you there. They're probably someone you worked with or have worked for. They've taken you through what their experiences have been. They will walk you through, they'll be a friend, they'll be, they'll be a guide, they'll guide you along and help you through the tactical and practical things in a position. And it can be personal or it could be professional. Now a coach, on the other hand, is someone who is skilled in helping you get out of yourself what you already have in there. Using a facilitative coaching model, what I, what I typically do is help you be the best you can be, maximize your potential. This is a group right here, as I look out on this group, is a group of high potential, highly successful executives. Now, I having had the pleasure and the honor of working with some of you, and matter of fact, in some of your staff, I know what a great job you do here. And I've flown out of DFW since 1990-ish, 91. So I know what a great job you do. I've seen the expansion, I've seen the growth, and what a wonderful job you do. So you must be good at what you do. Would you agree? Yes. Please say yes. yes. Okay, good. <laughs> That's right. This is yes, this is no. All right? You're good at what you do. But could you be a little bit better? A coach is going to be the one that's going to help you get that edge. Get that new edge for you. And my job today is to give you some skills, tips, and hints some practical things you can take away, because I'm always about giving away what I call the meat of what I do. Here's what I'm going to leave you with some meat. There's going to be some handouts. There's going to be some work. You're probably going to do some exercises. I promise you, you're not going to be running like you will out there in my group. Okay, so everyone will be stay seated. But you're going to take some things away that you can use for the rest of your life, if you choose. So coaching is about helping you become the best that you can be. Is that fair enough? First thing, though, is you have to figure out, are you coachable? Are you coachable? And every time that I engage with a client, I ask them three questions. Are you willing to be honest with yourself? Are you willing to make change? Are you willing to change what you need to be doing? And are you willing to put in the time and the effort it's going to take to get the changes that you want? If you can answer those questions 
with a resounding yes, you're coachable. If you cannot, any one of those questions is not a resounding yes, you have to ask yourself the fourth question. What will it take for me to get a yes on those three questions? Fair enough? Okay. It's about your attitude. It's about the attitude that you take. Um, it's been said, and we talked about stress. I mean, I love when Larry talked about stress, Dr. Anders talked about stress. How many have stress in their life? Come on, this is real, it's just us kids, right? Stress. Well, you know what the reality is? When we deal with something, you, look, you have to look at it in two ways. Can I do something about it? So then what should you do? Something about it, take care of it. If you can't do anything about it, why are you worried about it? How often do we worry about stuff that we can't control? That ever happen? I have teenage daughters, so I worry about lots of stuff that I can't control sometimes. If some of you parents, how many have parents have teenagers of some sort? Yeah, we worry about all kinds of things. But you know what's going to happen? So, I mean, you know, and I talked about a little bit about attitude here. And how much do you think this glass weighs? Give me a guess. How about some guesses? Five ounces. Five ounces, okay. Anybody else? There's no wrong answers, guys. Really? Glass and water or glass of water? What I'm holding in my hand, how much do you think this glass of water weighs? Man, I've got some engineers in this place, don't I? <laughs> eight, five, seven or eight, okay. And it's not as much as it weighs but how long am I going to hold it up? Problems that you have, issues that you face. If I hold this class up for a minute, no problem, right? I got no problem whatsoever holding it up for a minute. Now I hold it up for an hour, my arm's going to get a little sore, isn't it? Now what if I hold it up all day? My arm will probably be debilitated and won't be able to use it for a couple of days at least. This is like the problems and things you worry about. That's stress in your life. If you think about it for a minute and let it go, how do you feel? Good or bad? Good, yeah, it's done. Think about it for an hour, how are you feeling? Have a little anxiety? Maybe a little bit of anxiety? What if you think about it all day long? And I know you're guilty. I can see it in your face. Yeah, I can tell. Have you ever done that before? Worried about it all day long. And how's that affected your mental health? It's down. And this is interactive, by the way. So if you don't laugh and joke and talk back, it really doesn't work very fun. So, because I'm pretty interactive in my stuff. So think about it. How often are you holding on to things all day long? How often are you holding that glass of water all day long and how's that affecting you physiologically both mentally and physically put the glass down guys plain simple and easy and I'm, told, I'm all about what they call the bald truth figure out why they say that about me I, t I like to say I speak the bald truth because it's simple applied common sense my dad had a saying, he says, common sense is not a common virtue. This is a room of highly intelligent, highly educated individuals. Sometimes we're, we hold that glass all day long, don't we? Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. The congregation, I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, that was what I needed there. So, how do we get rid of it? What's our biggest stressor? in our lives. What's the thing that drives us all crazy? People. People. People are good. What do we struggle with the most? I'm going to ask you, say, what do we struggle with the most? Time. How many struggle with time? Managing their time. Whoa. <laughs> you got some good stuff going on in the back there. How many here struggle with time? at least a little bit occasionally, struggle managing their time. 
Time management is probably the biggest stressor that you can have. So how do you manage your time? What do you do to manage your time? Would you like to have some tips, hints, and ideas? Would you like to have some tips? You, you got to yell it out here, guys. Okay. I'm going to give you some couple, couple tips and things that I use on a regular basis. We're not even going to get into your handouts and your books yet. I'm warming you up first because we're going to make you work. I have a system I call the three D's. You must put all of your things that you have to address in the category of one of these three D's. Now, how many here get besieged by email every day? Yeah. How many get besieged by paper that gets on your desk of stuff? I don't know what reports and files and things you've got to look at. Everybody, every day we get stuff. So here's how you handle this. And it's a time suck, is it not? Just sucks the life out of you, sucks the time out of you. It just, it's, it's amazing how much the stuff that other people give us to do takes away from what we really need to be doing. So the first thing you look at, when email pops in, first question you want to ask yourself, can I do it? First D is do it. If you can do it, well guess what? Do it. And if you can't do it right away, when are you going to do it? Decide when you are going to do it. The second one, if you can't do it, can you delegate it? Now a bunch of highly effective managers know all about delegation, right? Right? Yes. Yeah, delegation is the key to leadership. How do you get other people to do things you want done because they want to do them? And that's a quote from President Dwight David Eisenhower. Also a West Point grad, I may add, from my friend Armin. Absolutely. How do you get people to do things you want done because they want to do it? That's delegation. That's leadership. This is a leadership group right here. Delegate it. If you can't do it, you can't delegate it, what's left? Delete it. Delete it. Dump it. Get rid of it. It's a piece of junk anyway. It's never going to get touched. That's it. Get rid of it. It's that simple, folks. It's that easy. And you know, and I'm, like I said, applied common sense here. We try to com complicate things too much, too much, too often. Make it simple. You know, you've all heard the KISS principle, right? All right, if you're all saying yes, I won't have to repeat what it actually stands for. But you know what it stands for. Keep it simple. Sally, that was my mom's name, so I'll keep it simple, Sally. But that's the reality of it. Keep it simple. So there are a couple, couple principles. Uh, Parado's principle. Anyone familiar with Parado's principle? Yes? No? 80-20 rule. Parado's principle is 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of your work that you're going to, your productivity is going to be done in 20% of your time. And 20% of your productivity, productivity is going to be in 80% of your time. Think about that. I have a client who works for, uh, I'll give you a, a broad spectrum without violating any uh, confidentiality here. Client works for a large um, public accounting firm. And in, guess what time it is this time of the year? Tax time. He is, and he's in, by the way, he's in the tax section too. So he says, you know what? I go in about 8.30 every morning. I drive over to Dallas. I go in about 8.30 every morning. I said, why don't you go in at 7? I didn't thought of that. He says, you know, I used to do that 10 years ago when I was a junior partner. Now I'm a senior partner. I said, why don't you try it for the next couple of months? So he did. You cannot believe the amount of work that he's getting done, how much he's pushing out, how much is productivity. Because you know that 20% of that day, that hour and a half in the morning, he's getting most of his work done. And then he deals with all the other stuff the rest of the day. Isn't that funny? That's it. That's what it is. You want to be able to do it. It's Parado's principles. Parkinson's law. Anybody familiar with Parkinson's law? Time management rule here. Parkinson's law. The amount of time will, the amount of work will expand to fit the amount of time available. Have you ever had to do a re one hour report that you knew the report's gonna take you an hour to do, but you had the whole day to do it? I've got a manuscript due May 1st. Do you think I'm gonna be cramming on the weekend of April 27th, 28th, 29th to finish that manuscript? Nope. 
I'm that close. I can finish it up by the end of the weekend. That's how close I am to, to the second book, Roll Up Your Sleeves and Get to Work. The bald truth on getting what you want. So look for it in newsstands all over. That's my only shameless plug today. But we all, Parkinson's Law says the amount of work will expand to fit the time available. We do it. Yeah, I've got all eight hours to do it, so I'll just get there. And all of a sudden, you're down and you got that report and you look up and it's 445. And Johnny's got a game at six. Because you promised Johnny you'd be at the game at six, right? Now it's 445. You got an hour report to do because, you know, I can get to it. I should get to it. I should get to it. We do it. I see a couple guilty stares coming back my way. You know who you are. Yeah. Efficiency is getting things done with the least amount of expended energy. Effectiveness is getting the right things done with the least amount of expended energy. Would you rather be efficient or effective? Effective, effective. good answer. Right answer, by the way, be effective. I could be efficient in doing things that aren't really important, but if I'm effective, I'm getting done what I need to get done. Think about all so far what I've talked about. You want to reduce your stress? You want to go, <sighs> take a deep breath, right? Would all those things help you so far? Just the little tidbits you've gotten so far? Well, good, because I have another four hours of this and then we'll get out of here. <laughs> but seriously, what we need to be doing as individuals is really finding out where we want to go and what we want to do. So I'm going to take you through an exercise right now. What I'd like to do is take you through an exercise. Um, but first, I want to talk to you about the way that you think about what you do. How many here think they have a pretty good attitude? Yes, most people think you yes or raise your hand, whatever you want, pretty good attitude. See, stress is about, reducing stress is about choices. Um, I was in the restaurant business, gosh, 100 years ago. I started my career in the restaurant business. I bought my first restaurant at the age of 22. And I love hearing Larry's story on how he came about through that, through adversity and all that. But I bought my first restaurant at the age of 22, right out of college, dumber than a box of rocks, had no idea, had no clue what I needed to do, but it sounded like a fun thing. Buy my own restaurant. I could eat and drink for free. And one of the things that I, that I learned there was there's so much about this industry, but you meet so many different characters. You meet a lot of really fun characters in, in this business. And I met a guy named Michael. Now, I can attest part of my attitude to Michael. Michael was one of those guys you just love, love to hate. Because he was always so positive. He was always so upbeat every single day. You go, Michael, how you doing? Man, how are you? Good to see you. I'm, if I was any better, I'd be twins. Man, I'm, life is so good, I can barely stand it. It's like, dude, what did you take this morning? But that was his attitude every single day. You know. <laughs> Might have been. <laughs> you know him. Yeah, so, so think about it. So he's there every single day. And he had a following of people that would come in to see him. And he, he you know, if you know anything about the restaurant business, once you, you, you kind of bounce between restaurants in, that, in those that day and age, you would do what you can do and move on to the next one. I opened 17 restaurants in 13 years. So I was a kind of a, <laughs> not be good for my HR hiring. My resume was a little long. But that's just the nature of it. And people would follow him to his next restaurant. Employees would follow him to his next restaurant. They loved this guy because he was so positive. He was uplifting. He kept them going. And, you know, he was just great. I said, Michael, what's, go what's, what's up? How do you do this? He says, Rick, every morning, every single morning, I wake up and I know that I have two choices. Really simple. I have two simple choices. I told you I was going to keep it simple today. Two simple choices. I can choose to be in a good mood or I can choose to be in a bad mood. Well, I choose a good mood because a bad mood is no fun. Ruins everybody's day, including mine. And that was just his simple philosophy in life. I choose to smile. I choose to say something nice. I choose to enjoy the day, embrace what's coming my way, not go, oh, God, it's morning, but wake up and go, thank God it's morning. I am excited for the day. So think about that. If you woke up every morning and went, man, I'm glad to be alive, as opposed to, oh my gosh, the sun came up, I can't stand it. Wouldn't that be a little nicer? 
So Michael just went on, and I got out of the restaurant business, and I got into uh, management and, and worked in my, my professional career after I played for a couple of years. But I got a real job, and it went on, and I lost track of Michael. But you know, you hear from friends, you hear from people, and he, Michael, about a year or two later, he, how do I put this? He made the cardinal sin. Had a cardinal sin for the restaurant manager. He was there in the morning, doing the receipts, sitting at his desk. He left the back door propped open. Sitting there pretty much by himself. And you know what happened. I think you can already, two men came in and they robbed him at gunpoint. And being the happy, nice guy he did, didn't work that well. So they said they want, they want all the money out of the receipt. So he went down to the safe and hands shaking, just scared to death. I mean, I don't know if anyone has ever faced that type of situation, but I haven't, and I don't know how scared I would be. Down, his hand was shaking on the knob of the safe. And he got, they shot him. EMS came, began to work on him. Worked on him feverishly, feverishly worked on this guy. Worked on him. And he got out of the hospital and I ran into him about six, or seven months later. I said, Michael, how's it going? He says, well, I had 18 hours of surgery. He says, um, but you know what, if I was a better, any better, I'd be twins. You wanna see my scar? <laughs> it's like, no, dude, I'll pass on the scar. But I said, tell me what happened. He says, I left the stupid door open. I wasn't paying attention. I got shot. But the EMS guys, they were awesome. They showed up. They were working on me. They were telling me, you're going to be all right. Hang in there, buddy. We're going to get you. You're going to be all right. You're going to do this. Come on, we're getting you to the hospital. Hang in there. And they wheeled me in. And I'm like going, oh, yeah, OK. They wheeled me into the emergency room. And there's doctors and nurses. Everybody's out there. They're ripping my clothes off. And they're working on me. And the, the doctors are looking at me. And I could see in their eyes, this guy ain't gonna make it. I could see in their face, this is a dead man. And the doctor's working on me, he says, I was laying there and the doctor's working on me. And he said, Rick, this nurse, I think her name was Nurse Ratched, right? He says, this big burly nurse was over there, she's, she's yelling questions at me, she's yelling at me, she's going, okay, this and this, and she's, are you allergic to anything? And he said, I looked up at her and went, yes! Everybody stopped. I'm like, what's he allergic to? We can't give him anything. What are you allergic to? Bullets. <laughs> <laughs> he says, at that moment, just that happened. They all laughed. And he says, guys, work on me as if I'm going to live, not as if I'm going to die. I choose to live today. See, he had a choice. And now he's a healthy, happy father of two. But you got to know it was his choice that makes the difference. It's your choice every single day that makes the difference in the people that you lead, in your well-being. You can do all the exercise. You can eat all the right foods. You can go to the doctor all the time. But if you don't think you're going to live, you ain't going to live. You've heard the saying, if you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're right. Bottom line, your brain doesn't know what's real and what's not real. If you tell your brain you're sick, you're probably going to feel sick. Whether you are or not, you're probably going to feel sick. So the first thing you want to do to maximize your personal potential, to reduce your stress, is tell yourself, I don't have any stress. Now, let's not be silly about it. Don't go, if you're in a, you know, think about your garden. You walk around your garden and say, no weeds, no weeds, no weeds in your garden, right? and you never pick the weeds, well, you're gonna have weeds in your garden. But you can tell yourself, this is okay. I'm not gonna freak out about this. Now I'm gonna do something about it. It's about your attitude, it's about the commitment that you make and the actions that you're gonna take. So, in order to do that, if you open your books, you're gonna see what we call, <laughs> the life balance wheel. Now I had a really cool slide. And can I have some help? I have somebody. I brought toys. 
I'm going to give you all some markers to play with. Here's some more. Anybody want crayons? I got cra who likes crayons? <laughs> I knew Byford. Byford would like those. Yeah. Who needs some more? Some markers here. Here, Judy. Can you get those back there? Perfect. All right. This is what we call our life balance wheel. And this is where you get to have fun. You get to be back in kindergarten a little bit. Because you know, you guys do a lot of important stuff. A lot of important work here. So here's what I'd like you to do. We've broken the life wheel into three core components. You notice the three core components here. One is connections. The second is your financial well-being. And the third is your personal growth, personal well-being. And each one of those three has three separate sub-areas. So we will be looking at these sub-areas. How are you doing in that area of your life? Your career, how are you doing in your career? And if you think you're doing really well, look, I get to play with markers too, I just love this job. Go ahead and color it in. Color that sucker in, see? Color it in. Got an idea? So go ahead and color it in. Now, what I'd like you to do is take all nine areas. I will give you two minutes. Take all the markers you want. I'll give you two minutes to go ahead and define where you are today. Because the first thing you have to do is define where you are before you can get to where you want to go. It's like if you were to go to a restaurant and you called the restaurant and said, how do I get there? What's the first question whoever is on the other end of the phone is going to ask you in return? Where are you? Where are you? That's right. We're going to define where you are today. Now, this is not very scientific. I know we have a lot of engineers in the room. I could tell. But just go ahead and have fun with it. If you colored in an area pretty heavy, almost 100% or more, or even more than 50 or 60%, that's probably an area you're very comfortable in. It's probably an area you're satisfied in. There's no, not much stress in that area. You're pretty, pretty confident in that area. Now, let's talk about the other areas that you may not have colored in quite so much. Those are probably areas of dissatisfaction, somewhere you know you can make some improvement or you'd like to make some improvements in your life. And you notice that career is only one of nine components of this wheel. How often do we make career the component of our wheel and forget about the rest? Physical health, mental health, social, getting around along with people. So I tell you all that to tell you this. These are the areas, when you see those areas of dissatisfaction, that's where you want to begin to work. Look at those areas. See, what can I do to shore those areas up? What can I do? to help me feel better about myself in that area. Well, there's one way to do that. You need to set some goals. We need to begin to start working on some goals. And there's a, there's a cool little poem in there that's one of my favorites and I included it just for y'all a little bit. But life is 10% of how you deal with things or what happens to you and 90% of how you deal with it. Life is 10% what happens and 90% of how you deal with it or how you handle it. Think about that. You can't control that 10%, but what you can control is the way you think and the way you act or respond to the situation. So the best way to do that that I have found to reduce your stress is know what you want to get. If you know what you want to get, does it make it easy to get there? If you're going on a trip, I actually had a conversation with a pilot yesterday. I thought it was kind of cool, and I didn't realize he was a pilot. but. Uh, we were talking about uh, flying. Actually, he's a, he's a pretty high-powered attorney. It was kind of cool. I didn't know he was a pilot, though. He says, in pilots, when we're, the only time that we're truly on schedule and we're on course is when we land and when we take off. So you guys are critical to keeping these guys on course. Because once they leave DFW, they're off course the whole time. Because they're always making course corrections. So we've got to know where you want to go. But you first have to know where you are. You've just graphically drawn where you are in your life. 
This is a snapshot of where you are today, how you feel today. So, now if you flip the next page, let's take a look. We've got a system that, that I call the SmartWay goal setting system. We use a process called SmartWay. I'm going to go through it pretty quick because I know I'm, I want to be cognizant of your time. I want to be respectful of your time today. In fact, many of your people, at least 30 of your staff at DFW area know the smart way process and use the smart way process. Here's what it stands for. S stands for specific. Your goals, when you write your goals, they must be specific. And this is a coach Rickism, by the way, the smart way. Many of you may have heard of smart goals in the past, but we add the way part and I'm going to show you why. S is specific. The M is measurable. Dr. Anderson talked about we can, what we measure we can manage. We have to put measurement in. The A is attainable. Is it something that's actually attainable that you could do? Is it realistically high? The R is realistically high. Is it going to stretch you? Is it going to help you grow as an individual, personally or professionally? The T stands for time. I like to use the words time bound. Is there a time frame on your goal? The W is the critical part. How many here have goals? By a little show of hands. How many here could show me their goals? Great. How many here have them with them? Excellent. I love it because they're written down, right? Linda's written her goals down and she has her with them. That's it. We all have iPhones and smartphones and all this kind of cool stuff. Put them in there, but they have to be written down. The A is aligned. Your goals have to be aligned because if, if you have incongruent goals, you're going to be confused which way to go. And the why, well, whose goals are they, folks? Yours. 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 They're right. They're your goals. So you have to have buy-in with the goals. How often do we get goals from higher up, from the board, from higher up, from the public? We want this to happen. We want that to happen. And it's pushed down. Does that happen? All the time. But I will tell you, you must buy in your component of it. Your part of that is critical to buy in on. Then you can make it a reality. I was in a sales environment for most of my professional career. And I would have to drive down sales and numbers and goals to my guys and gals. But until they owned those goals, they took them and made them their own, very rarely did they achieve them. So I challenge you today to own your goals. Now, in order to accomplish your goals, in order to get to where you want to go, what's a good thing to use that we have today? A GPS, right? I drove to College Station last weekend and I put it in my little GPS and it got me right there. Whoop, where's my whoops? Yeah, there we go. I told you, I, I've got a junior down there. I got the whoop. She gets the whoop now. Yeah. So we, we have what's called the Peak Performance GPS, the goal planning system. It's right there in front of you. When you write a goal, write it in the smart way fashion. And it goes in that box where it says goal. Write it down. Make sure the sentence makes sense. Make sure it's something that is specific enough that you're, you can share it with someone and they can help you. So let's, let's just make an example. And I'll pick on myself because it's easy to do. I want to lose 10 pounds by my birthday. Okay? That's my goal. My birthday is May 10th, by the way. I'll be 54 years old, and I want to lose 10 pounds by May 10th. That's what, three weeks away? It's doable. Is that specific? Is it measurable? Yeah, I got a scale. Is it attainable? Yeah, I, I can do it. Is that realistically high? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Is it time bound? May 10th. That's right, because Kenny Chesney's the next day, and I want to look good for Kenny Chesney. Right? I have goals for other things, right? Is it written down? It is on my board at the house. Is it aligned with my goals? Yes, I want to stay healthy. I want to be able to, to have grandkids and great grandkids. I want to live a long life. And is it mine? Absolutely, it's mine. So I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to use the GPS system for this. I'm going to use our GPS. I'm going to write down, I want to lose 10 pounds by May 10th. That's the goal. The rewards are obvious. I'm going to feel better, look better. The consequences are I won't feel good, I won't look good. Make it real simple for you. Then we use a process called GoSat. 
because we've got to go to the satellite for the GPS. When you have a GPS, you go to the satellite. GOSAT stands for your goal. Identify your obstacles. What are the obstacles that you may face that may get in your way? Diet, exercise, all the stuff folks were talking about today. All those things might be some obstacles that get in your way. Gee, I don't get to the gym enough. Boy, I don't eat right. Oh, I need to go have my health taken care of. I gotta check my blood pressure. Whatever that means. Come up with the obstacles. And for each obstacle, come up with a solution. The S in GOSAT is solutions. The A is the critical piece, is actions. What actions will you take? I'll begin to eat better. I'll go to the gym three times a week. And for me to lose 10 pounds in two and a half weeks, is gonna be, I'm going to five days a week. And then T, time. When are you gonna do that? When are you gonna take that action? It's that simple, folks. This process has changed dramatically the lives of thousands of people that I've coached over the last 10 years. I had one executive of a $10 billion company and he's given me permission to give a little bit of information. He used this process to set out what he wanted to do in his organization. He was, a, he was a, the chief, chief operating officer, COO of a $10 billion company. He cut his meeting time in half by coming in, knowing what he wanted, knowing what the obstacles might be, and he taught this to his staff. Cut his meeting time in staff. Now, Ken, how many meetings do you have a, a day a week? A lot? More than a lot. If you could cut that meeting time down by a third, what would that give you back? Too much time. A lot of time. Would that reduce your stress? Would it help you be more effective to do the things yeah. that you could do? Yeah. And I pick on Mr. Buchanan because we've met and we've you know, spoken a few times. But the reality is everyone in this room has lots of meetings. If you could use a system that would help you get to where you want to go, when you want to go, and how you want to get there, would that be worth your time this afternoon? Yeah, I, I would hope so. So folks, I'm going to leave you with one last thing. And it's really this. Decide what attitude you want to wake up in the morning. Make a choice of what attitude you want to wake up with every single morning. Make a commitment. In fact, make a commitment to someone sitting next to you. Decide what you want to do and make them your accountability partner. Find an accountability partner and ask them to hold you accountable. Of course, you know what's gonna happen if you ask them, they get to ask you. And the best way to be held accountable is to hold someone else accountable. It's uncomfortable. It's different, it's change, but change is growth. So I'll challenge you all, find yourself someone who you want to hold you accountable and then you get to hold them accountable, because that's the quid pro quo. Make a commitment to what you want to do, and just go out and take action. Roll up your sleeves, which is why I named the book, Roll Up Your Sleeves and Get to Work, because it all comes down to the bottom line. We can talk about it, we can talk about concept, we can talk about theory, we can talk about all these great ideas, but if you don't get up and just do it, nothing's ever gonna happen. <coughs> So folks, my challenge as I leave here today, as I leave you to go on, is to get your head on right. Make the right choice in the morning. Make a commitment to yourself, because yourself is what's gonna make a commitment and a difference to your staff. And then finally, get out and take action. I thank you for today, I thank Executive Medicine. If you'd like to know more about coaching and all that, I'll be around for a little bit and all my numbers or information are in there. I thank you. Have a great rest of your day and God bless you. Oh wait, I have a present for everybody. I have presents. I told you about common sense, right? These are the 12 common sense commandments for success. You tell me what you think. Judy.